there's nothing wrong with people trying out those kinds of products and finding out they don't work very well because the, the consequences are not are not forever. It's just I, I got a bad game. You wouldn't say that if you were the eight year old who'd been saving fifty <laughs> bucks to Well those consequences are pretty dramatic. Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Peter Van Doren, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of Regulation Magazine. Welcome back to the show, Peter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think I think that since I now have a, a bank of synthesizers, uh, that I should maybe re uh, compose your theme music as our only guest with his own theme music. I could make a, a real acid banger out of it, maybe put some robot voices in there, but we could put that on, on the table because today we're talking about uh, the FDA. Why do we have an FDA? There's an intro. Uh, <laughs> well, every time in history when there has been a scandal or a muckraking incident regarding first mostly food and later uh, drugs, the Congress responds by passing statutes that say we need to do something about this because there was an incident and people died or populist press said consumers were not being well served by uh, markets as we understood them at the time. And there was uh, too much fraud, too much deceit, too much fill in the blank. And thus consumers were not well served by what happened? Well, it's 1906 for a food, right? 1906. But that was just food and labels. And this goes back to stuff we learned in high school about Upton Sinclair and the meatpacking industry in Chicago and, um, you know, kind of the 60 minutes of its time kind of showing uh, what stuff was being put into what, what we now call industrialized food and how different that was and blah, blah, blah. And so in 1906, a statute was passed, the first Food and Drug Act, which basically had a lot to do with food. And as always, even now, it was labeling, which was what, so, so something called poisonous products could not be sold in interstate commerce. And then we had our first labeling requirement, because remember back then, as in terms of medicines, we really didn't have what we now think of as pharmaceuticals. Instead, we had what at the time were called elixirs, which were mostly opiate-based and alcohol-based stuff. Uh, Coca-Cola was, you know, had cocaine in it when it was invented, and and so the what we now call patent medicines, which Lydia Pinkham's, uh, you know, cure for everything, and there were just thousands of these things. And the 1906 Act said, well. There's stuff in there and you have to tell people that there's stuff in there. So if there's alcohol or morphine or opium or cannabis, those were all required additives that had to be uh, disclosed to consumers. And you could be fined, the manufacturer could be fined if the label was not accurate. If it had those things in it, um, you could call it an elixir, for example. And if it did not have alcohol or morphine or opium in it. Um, you could not label it as what was at the time a common term called an elixir. A question about how this plays out, though, because there are lots of crappy products all the time, and we all have the experience of buying a product and then learning that it's not very good. You know, I mean, it was terrible as a kid to save up your money, the 60 bucks for a Nintendo game or 50 bucks, I guess, at the time, and and then come home and like, it's just a crappy game, right? And we've all had that experience, but we don't, we don't have like the government hop in and say, like, we don't call on the government to say it should certify that all video games aren't crappy and buggy before they can be released. There's lots so there's, there's lots of bad products here. It seems like so many of these products there's a health angle, but I'm not going to make a product that poisons people because I'm either going to get in trouble for it, right? Or, or I'm going to turn off my customers. You know, you can only, you can only sell so many products that poison people before people stop buying them. But on the other hand, things like elixirs and whatever else, the way that bad products get filtered out is someone buys that, takes it, sees it doesn't actually help them, 
um, it doesn't accomplish much, and they tell their friends, and it gets a reputation for not working very well, just like different pizza chains get a reputation for having bad pizza. So why do we need to inject the government in here specifically? Um, well, let me get, I mean, now we're into kind of the metaphysics of knowledge and knowledge acquisition, and then how how do people make decisions based on what knowledge exists? And there's certainly the the, the market-oriented argument is, as you stated, which is that there's learning, there's updating, there's et cetera, et cetera. And then we put a little asterisk, which say, well, with health, ooh, you know, if you... It, sometimes there's learning and then there's bad effects from that kind of learning through disease or death. And so the the question, and then people vary as to how much knowledge they want to have about something before they ingest it or use it in a, in a medical context. Uh, the, the bad news for our side, I think, is what I call the nutraceutical industry, the nu nutritional supplement industry, which is not regulated in the way that pharmaceuticals are. And so there's a, you know, people every day put in lots and lots of stuff into their bodies based on claims they see on in advertising that this improves memory or this improves a cold or this does this, right? Sort of natural alternatives to uh, what people call pharmaceutical, you know, chemically uh, created and scientifically studied drugs. And the evidence is overwhelming from studies that have been done about these kinds of supplements that there is no learning that people ingest these things, even though the effects are zero. Um, as best we can tell, the, the negative effects of these things are not that large either. So basically, lots of Americans continually waste their money over hundreds of years starting with elixirs and things like that, things that really didn't have any effects on health other than alcohol made you sleepy. And when you were sick, that in fact was the most useful thing we could do for you back then. So the evidence is not striking that there's lots of learning in the market we have, which is re relatively unregulated uh, for what I call nutritional supplements. And, and uh, Is that necessarily a bad thing though? I mean, you said that no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying the Aaron makes, I mean, market oriented people and, and economics says, if you keep making stupid decisions, eventually you run out of money, right? That's usually right. There's a budget constraint and people, they learn and they basey and update. We have all sorts of technical terms for, for this kind of process. But there's a whole industry out there where there's not much updating. I mean, every night on television, I see people saying, I take Prevagen and my memory is improved. Well, <laughs> I, I suspect that that actually isn't true. So what Aaron says, they talk to their friends. Well, that's how these kinds of over-the-counter things are in fact sold, which is people make inferences, even doctors, right? There's observational studies in medical journals all the time, which is I studied these patients, I gave them some stuff, and then, ooh, they got better or something followed and nothing bad seemed to happen. Therefore, we, this is a cure or this is something. And then we do trials and we find out almost all these claims, many, many, many of the claims that people make based on observations, right? Their personal experience as well as the experience of others turns out in a random assignment, placebo controlled environment, very, very few of these knowledge understandings that people have are actually true. And part of the struggle over the FDA is, um, the different epistemological concepts people have about knowledge, knowledge acquisition, how they learn about things, and what they think of something called science and scientific experiments and what they learn from them. So, I mean, it's, it's it doesn't seem the, like the worst thing ever. People do a lot of things to uh, make themselves feel better. Uh, you know, they believe in horoscopes and they believe in tarot cards and, and you know you can list them on and on and on and on um and generally we say it's like hey it's harmless like i mean you maybe you spend a lot of money on tarot cards and you think that people you know these these guide your life in some way but like ultimately you know it's your money and it's kind of harmless and it seems to me that if any of these supplements you know was 
significantly harmful, that would be indicated pretty quickly. Uh, so it just sort of indicates that they're they're they don't really do anything. But if it makes you feel better, then go for it, kind of thing. I mean, that that would be one way an economist would look at it, right? Well, it, it actually the key the key is how rare are the negative effects or how common that is the ability of people to see negative things happening from observational data is uh, much, much easier if in fact the harm is immediate, obvious, and large. <laughs> uh, small negative effects that are detected at the rate of one or two or five percent of the population actually are even difficult to find in trials with a normal number of subjects in them because Trying to differentiate actual harm from random error is actually difficult. The more rare the uh, negative event is, and and that so that plays into to this. Uh, so yes, the nutritional supplements uh, don't. In fact, the trials that have been of them don't seem to find any any even rare harms. They just don't have any positive results. Just a waste of money. The the um, the issue of finding real harm. We need trials to find those things. If in fact the harm is real but small, and then it's difficult. Even then, because the trials aren't big enough, and that's that's an issue over time in the FDA. When uh, it's the, the difference between doing a trial with eight thousand subjects or something, which is sort of the as big as a trial as the FDA would ever require versus having it out there in the marketplace where 300 million people use it. Um, same thing with right now. I mean, the, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, right? We've got 224 rare blood clots in Europe out of what, 200 million, something like that. Um, so th finding that kind of error, can't occur even in, tr in a trial setting. So all the trials that Moderna and Pfizer and J&J &J ran, you couldn't detect that kind of error. Um, same thing with sort of, I guess, some of the, Vi the so-called Vioxx scandal that happened with the, the drug Vioxx and the FDA. The, the heart attack rate from Vioxx appears to be in the kind of 1% land. And that even in a trial of 8,000 people, that's the kind of error that can be easily confused with uh, noise in which it's, there's nothing really going on. And so the more risk averse you are and the more zealous you are, the more you want a larger and, and greater uh, observational data or word of mouth, if you will. You want to hear from thousands of people that they have done this and nothing bad has happened to any one of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people vary as to how worried they are about this. Uh, and it depends on the kind of thing we're worried about. Heart attack and death, you don't get to a redo. Whereas the kind of learning that Aaron talked about, about video games, there's nothing wrong with people trying out those kinds of products and finding out they don't work very well because the, the consequences are not, are not forever. It's just, I, I got a bad game. You wouldn't say that if you were the eight-year-old who'd been saving books and bucks to <laughs> well, those consequences are pretty dramatic. But I we we started this conversation with in the early 1900s, we have a reaction to the Upton Sinclair stuff. And then you sent us one of the reasons that we keep bringing you back on the show is because you always send us these really comprehensive outlines to work off of ahead of time. So Trevor and I, it's you know, you do the research for us. Uh, but in that you have this long list of events that you know led to more and more and more stuff either falling under the purview or arguments that should be regulated and so on. And I'm curious how often in retrospect it turns out to have been wrong. Because we can, you know, we can say we it, we should have stopped this medication or we should have like, you know, these they were at putting these additives in the food or whatever, but so much of this is like it's small risks, it's large studies. How often do we say, like, we react to something, there was something bad that we thought was happening, 
we react to it, we give the FDA more power, we control for it, we ban it, and then later on it turns out like it wasn't that big of a deal really, or we got the science wrong, or those additives weren't necessarily a problem. Like does it does this run in the other direction as far as like updating our knowledge? Well, sort I mean, the 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 honest answer I think is we don't know. Um well, one way to think about this is um if you think of the 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 denominator of a ratio as the number of new drugs, investigational new drugs, right? That where some manufacturer says, I'm going to study the properties of this because I think it might have this beneficial effect for people, but I need to do trials because of the current FDA regime. And I'm, you know, going to pursue this first for safe, safety and small trial phase one, and then two and three are safety and two and efficacy and dosage. And then three is mostly efficacy and not much safety. And the data are overwhelming about how few drugs ever come out of this process, right? It's only about 8%. So you're saying, how about those other 92% of things that in a laissez-faire world, some manufacturer might have had the uh, the cojones, if I could use that technical term, too, to say, "I'm gonna, I'm just gonna send this out there and say, I think we've identified this, and it might be good and it might be bad. We don't know very much, but here it is, all right. And here's what's in it, and here's what some smart people think it might do." And here's what some other smart people think it might not do. And so, but in the current world, there isn't a reinvestigation of those things, right? Or, or I mean, now and then there is, there's a repurposing of products, mostly that have already been approved for, for other purposes and are shown to have been safe and efficacious. For example, Viagra was a, it was a blood pressure drug that turned out to have other other uh, attributes and so but it already been approved right for this and then it was served another purpose so the, the question you ask is what would our world look like if all those 92 percent of things had been tried out how many bad events would the media and whatever ever be able to find the answer is i think probably a lot more than we now hear about because in fact None of those things get to market now. They're just stopped in phase one. It's remarkable how few get to even phase three. Of all those that get to phase three, a large majority of them get to market, right? It's a small percentage of them are stopped, but a whole bunch of things are just stopped right in the get-go. And so for us to argue what our world would be like, we'd have to say, well, what would people demand about using stuff if there were no restrictions, and we don't know the answer. I say um, the nutraceutical industry strikes me as bad evidence for us because people don't seem to demand very much at all. And uh, we need to eventually talk about medical devices, right? Which is even in the regulated world, the pharmaceutical world is very, very regulated and the medical device world is not. So we have we sort of have a quasi Cato world in the medical device world, and that isn't that pretty from our perspective either, or for, from a from a safety perspective. Um, in in that, um, clinical trials are not required, and there are lots of devices on there that have ended up doing lots of harm to people. And again, because we're not really laissez faire, we're in this mixed world. Where, I mean, you know, my wife's had five hip replacements. If we ever had a conversation with the doctor in which we asked him, well, what do you know about this hip and why? And the sad answer is, even though we're professionals and Catherine is a health professional, we've never asked those questions. So then you'd say, well, why? And the answer is because in the world we're in, everyone thinks someone has figured all this stuff out and no one should be scared of stuff that doctors are practicing widely. Whereas in a you know, from our opponent's view, a frightening Cato world, actually, it's certainly possible that consumers would be much more vigilant and much more worried and would require evidence, which in fact, in a new equilibrium, right, we'd have voluntary provision of knowledge rather than FDA requirement. But 
there's no place in the world that actually tries this out. So it's very hard to, to answer your question. So what is the process? Um, uh, I know that a big change occurred in the FDA and a lot of the criticisms comes in in 1962. So as you said, phase one, phase two, phase three, at the very beginning, it's like, does this poison you? Uh, but then you get to this question of, is it efficacious and like in suitably efficacious too? Like that, that someone is determining our level of risk and whether or not it is in terms of some bureaucrat, efficacious enough for us to take it, which seems a little weird. And that's where a lot of problems come in. And everything kind of changes then in 1962, right? Agreed. I mean, again, uh, some of our previous conversations about have been science and the limits of science. And I want to make our listeners very aware that I'm very into science. I love knowledge. I love the acquisition of knowledge. But I want to argue that decisions don't directly follow from science. You need to inject values and costs and benefit analysis, and people differ in that. And yet, instead, we have scientists in wrestling matches over trial data, which, which I mean, a trial is a trial, right? We know, it's just math. We have the plus, we, oh, and here's the other thing, which is what we learn from a trial is relative to what's called the standard of care. And so ironically, it's not always placebo. If we already have something on the market that deals with that, the control arm of the uh, trial is that standard of care, not just nothing, right? Because nothing would be unethical if we already have something that we think works, which may or may not be true. So uh, there is a whole game of what's the control arm of the trial and what's the experimental arm of the trial. And then what kind of people do we let into the trial? Do we exclude some people with pre-existing conditions? In other words, do we, do we rig the trial so that the likelihood of a good outcome or a bad outcome is in part determined by what lots of people we let in uh, to the trial? So then you get a result and you have this outcome in the experimental arm and you have the same outcome in, in the control arm. And then you measure whether the difference in incidence is great enough with some statistical confidence that we then can say scientifically, it looks like this thing makes, solves this medical condition relative to people who were in the, in the control arm and then full stop. Whether or not it should be approved or whether or not people should take it or not, depends on risk aversion and costs and benefits, which vary a lot across people. And, and yet we have a collective declaration on the part of, quote, a scientific advisory committee and then the FDA itself as to whether, not really about the science, but whether this drug is worth it or not, given everything we know and given how rare or not rare the condition, you know, all of those other things, which technically isn't science, it's, it's something else. So I know that I think that one of the first big papers on this that came out to discuss whether or not this kind of efficacy testing passes the cost benefit analysis was from Peltzman, I think in the early 70s. And so like when we're talking about how an economist would look at these efficacy trials and when drugs are blocked or when they're not allowed out or where people are not allowed to choose their own risk level, um, I mean, a, a Peltzman and many other economists have argued that you add all it up and ultimately it makes people worse off, not better, correct? His initial analysis said that. Uh, since then, in the <clears throat> notes I sent you, there's been subsequent uh, analysis of a particular regime change at the FDA, which was, uh, as conservatives have argued and everyone, and, and it's not, it's a true stylized fact that the FDA's, we know it's risk averse and we know it's slow. And so there's, uh, in 1992, the Congress passed a law that said, ah, oh, it's too slow. We got to speed this up, but we don't want to have taxpayers pay for it. Instead, we're going to charge drug companies for, in effect, hiring extra staff to speed the process of new drug applications in the, through the FDA. Well, it did speed up, it sped up quite dramatically. And then uh, econom an economist, Thomas Philipson, actually said, let's take 
pre and post 92, and then take all the drugs that were ever withdrawn after the speed up of the FDA process, right? So they were literally withdrawn and then calculate the life years lost in estimated life years lost from those drugs when they were on the market and then price those life years at the economist's standard value of a life year, which is somewhere between a hundred and three hundred thousand dollars And then he calculated, all right, this is the cost of the speed up. Okay. And it came up to some, like the notes uh, tell me how many thousands of life years were lost. I think it was in the tens of thousands. And then you multiply by a hundred thousand and you get a number in the billions of the costs of speed up. Then the benefits. And he said, well, then we know all the drugs that didn't cause any harm, but you got them faster. And it talked about literally through a discount rate, speeding up the consumer surplus that came from the speed up. And he came to a conclusion that they more or less balance out. So in other words, their cost of being faster and their benefits of being faster post 92, and they seem to be in order. So the kind of Ralph Nader consumer reports claim that the FDA has been corrupted by the user fees and the speed up of, of testing and things like that. Um, the evidence for that does not seem to be true. On the other hand, for our, from our side, um, there are costs of a speed up and the, and, and some drugs are withdrawn because we were a bit too hasty in, um, checking everything out. And, Again, the, the size of the trial and then how long, how long the trial goes on, right? You get this game of hmm, how long do we wait for side effects to show up? And then you need some medical and, and scientific understanding to make a guess about this drug affects this metabolic system in this way. And if we're going to see an outcome, it's likely to show up, you know, in such and such a length of time. So how are we measuring benefits or even conceptualizing benefits in this context? Because a, a drug, you know, we don't, there aren't many drugs out there that have nothing but positives. You take them and they make you feel awesome and there's no downsides. Or you take the drug and it just flat out kills you without doing anything nice for you in the time before. Uh, those, that's, you know, we can exclude those because they don't really exist. Everything else is about trade offs. And so if we have a drug that, say, prolongs late stage cancer by two months, but causes pneumonia during that time, right? Is that drug, do we put that drug in the positive camp or the negative camp? And then a lot of these things may have more, you know, no one wants pneumonia, um, but we might want it more than we want dying from cancer two months earlier. But then a lot of this is also just really individualized that you might say, you know, lots of activities that we take bring costs, but you might think of them, you know, you might think that the cost of playing a, um, a particular sport is the wear and tear on your body. But I don't even conceptualize that as a cost because I get so much out of playing the sport, that the wear and tear is just kind of an indicator that I've been successful at. Like, so how do we, when we're, we're economists putting on our economics hat to measure this stuff, how do we even begin to say this is a cost and this is a benefit or to, or to start measuring them against each other? So the Philipson study does that by taking consumer surplus and it's too hard in this kind of discussion to try to describe. I mean, it's basically people's willingness to pay for something above the actual cost of doing so, of providing that product, that's consumer surplus. It, it exists on a blackboard. Um, economists have various ways of attempting to measure that. Let's assume for purposes of discussion that they can, all right? And that's where this measurement came from in the Philipson study. And then all he said is, so we know what people's willingness to pay for stuff is relative to cost. He just studied the fact that that was moved up earlier, right? That's the benefit of a speed up. Okay. Your larger question, I mean, let me switch a bit to you, you asking also, why do we have to collectively consume this decision? And part of my outline that I sent to you guys was 
Peter's my, my way of looking at it. The meta question that I don't think enough people talk about, which I want to, is we have a regime for a hundred years now in which we acquire knowledge to inform our decisions by restricting decisions, right? In effect, we coerce drug manufacturers into performing scientific investigation of things. And why do they do that? Well, because we don't let them put a product onto market unless they do. Well, is there some other way? Do we have to do it that way? And the answer is no, right? We don't. Knowledge has public good characteristics. Once it exists, it's difficult or impossible to restrict knowledge or consumption to those who pay. So knowledge has the classic public good uh, definitional aspects to it that one learns in microeconomics. All right, so we could have NIH run lots and lots and lots and lots of trials. We could just raise taxes, we could spend money, and we could collectively uh, run science, but we just do it separately from decisions, right? We don't have to answer whether something should or shouldn't be on the market. It's just smart people do trials, they then write labels or they write circulars or they write articles in the New York Times. And it says, well, as best we can tell this, you'll get this benefit and you'll get this cost and it costs this much. And if we take a normal value of a human life, it may or may not, you know, blah, 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 right? Kind of all science nerddom forever. And then Consumer Reports and Channel 7 and Channel 4 try to distill it down to help people make decisions right the second way of doing it is we don't have publicly funded trial knowledge at all we just have laissez-faire and then through the kinds of arguments we've been talking about today we think through backwards induction that wow lots of people who worry about things would not consume products if no knowledge were provided so then we're back to companies would compete on the basis of the investigations they had done, and they would develop brand names over the acquisition and provision of information and blah, 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 blah. And then in Cato Equilibrium, we'd say, well, how different would the world look like in terms of knowledge generation than it would now? If you're left of center, you'd look at the nutraceutical industry and you'd say it's hopeless. There's far little, too little demand from an upper middle class point of view on the part of most people for knowledge. And there'd be lots and lots and lots of stupidity and harm out there in, in Cato world. And then if you're us, we point to the examples we think contradict that and we would say the opposite. And probably both are right, right? And then we get back to some people are risk averse and risk uh very, very hesitant to do stuff and other people are not. And we would then have to hope our institutions would live with the consequences. And in effect, would we let disasters occur? You know, in other words, there'd be incidents and they're just like in 1937, the so-called elixir sulfonamide scandal that led to the 38 amendments. Basically, a solvent was put into the first sulfa drugs to make it easy for kids to ingest when they had colds. And hundreds of them died because it was a poison. And we, some people knew that at the time, the chief chemist who made it for this firm didn't. Um, and oh my God, you know, the, you know what hit the fan, right? This thing killed kids. And in fact, the chemist involved committed suicide. He was so distraught over what he had done. So can we live with these kinds of things uh, and not have the political system intervene in our world? The answer is historically, the answer has been no. We just, uh, the, the, there's consume when, you know, so um, anyway, I, you but keep asking. On the other side of I this, um, a few years ago, uh, there was a case at the DC circuit called Abigail Alliance which came out of the death of a young woman named Abigail Burroughs who had a rare form of spine and neck cancer wherein she was told she could not use a drug to treat that cancer that had promising 
indications, um, but had not yet been approved for efficacy for that type of cancer. And she eventually died and a lawsuit in her name asked the question of whether or not there is a essentially a, a right um, in the Constitution or protected by the Constitution to try something to save your own life. And it seems weird that you would tell someone like that, ah, this is too risky for you when they're looking you know, at two months to live. And that's a big controversy, this right to try. And I know you you and others at, at Cato, like Michael Cannon, have disputed this. But to me, it seems pretty obvious that in those situations, taking taking someone's risk and telling them how much – how risky it is to you, if, if it's worth it to you, is really crazy. Yeah. I'm not disputing that. I mean, what the, the argument for – again, people who like trials, and I'm one of them, are – are, and I, Mike Cannon and I debate this, which is the people who defend trials and the knowledge that's acquired through trials do not believe we could run trials unless we can restrict access. Because if we don't restrict access, we never would get anyone to be in, an ex, in the control arm of an experiment. In other words, if there's a promising treatment and it's basically everyone involved is dying, how do you randomize people into the control arm so that you figure out whether or not this thing really does anything or not? If nobody's willing to be in a control arm, we'll never learn. Now, Mike Cannon says, what we need to do is pay people enough. In other words, we need to have control arms, not as mandatory guinea pigs because we don't have market access, because we don't have trials, but Knowledge is useful. Let's pay people to acquire knowledge. And the so-called challenge trials in Britain, right? Other countries have, we don't, but that in this vaccine, the development of the vaccine, we have in Europe, they had some challenge trials. And basically you pay uh, young, mostly young people a lot to be guinea pigs and they're in the control arm and, or et cetera. And, or in the experimental in the experimental arm in the case of a vaccine where we don't know what's going on, and um, so I'm not against access per se, but I I worry or people who defend trials it's extremely difficult and in fact impossible. I've been in debates with people a lot over this. So the Ezekiel Emanuel right came to Cato and it's a famous Cato discussion. I mean his his and most other people's position is that you cannot induce people uh, once the, the, the horse is out of the barn, right? You, once something's available, you then actually cannot conduct a trial uh, because once word is out, there's tremendous attrition in the arm that's not receiving treatment and the trial collapses. Um, and anecdotally, that's true in the current world. I mean, my wife has run a number of trials and once, um, the word is out tentatively that something that, right, that the committee has revealed some results and there's good news, it looks like, but we have to keep going to make sure everyone flees the trial. You just, you just can't randomize, you can't, you have tremendous attrition and you, you don't learn. And so then the question is, if we offered people enough money, would they stay and continue with the trial? And then we're back to who would come up with the money? taxpayers or would companies do this even in a world of, of free access? And the honest answer is we don't know because we've never tried this kind of world. What's the cost of that? So if, if we live in a world where a little bit of evidence comes out that this thing might work, but we don't know for sure, and then everyone flocks over to take it, if it turns out that it's then really dangerous, like, so let's, let's talk in the case of that Trevor mentioned of the woman with you know, the terminal cancer. Um, and it turns out it's really dangerous and it kills people who take it in that situation faster than they would have died. You know, it kills them in a month instead of two months or whatever. As that starts to come out, we're going to get an equilibrium back in the other direction because people are going to say, oh, it turns out, you know, like I'm not going to take, I'm not going to jump into this thing that, you know, so you get more people who are willing to not take it um, to test against. But if, if everyone rushes in and then it turns out the worst that it seems is that a bunch of people are then taking a drug that isn't doing anything. 
or doesn't have as much of a positive effect as we had originally thought, which is which is potentially a cost, but there's also that we have now in the interim potentially allowed people to be taking drugs that are helping them when before we would have been excluding them, right? Because we needed this control group. And so if we just opened it up to everything, it might be that there are more drugs out there that aren't as effective as we thought, but there would also be more drugs out there accessible to more people that are effective. Is that is that a problem or because it seems it seems odd to just necessarily say we're willing to potentially sacrifice people's lives in order to meet some knowledge threshold that we think is important because we're talking about people's lives here. Oh, I would I have to unpack all this. It's a <laughs> uh, I would resi- let's see. How can I remember I said what the current system does is prevent lots of stuff from being out there. Okay? So of the trials that are done on procedures and practices and all of that that are already out there, we almost exclusively find, not that they cause harm, but that they, that they, uh, the positive effects are very low. So this is the Robin Hansen, you know, we're, Mike, we're wasting somewhere between a third and a half of medical expenditures, even in the system we have now. So then we have to talk about, all right, in Cato land, what would insurers, right? So no one actually pays their own money for expensive stuff. So this is, so then in a laissez-faire world, what would insurers do? Well, insurers, right? Basically now there's a world where the FDA approves stuff. All right. So then everything that's FDA approved still isn't covered by insurance. Then Medicare goes through a process to try to say, well, we cover it. Well, then guess what? All the privates follow what Medicare does. So we'd have to We'd have to undo that entire world we have now in which Medicare approval of expenditures for something is the gold seal for everyone else to follow. So then again, in Cato land, would we have people using their own money to do stuff? And the answer is, nah, not much. What they would say is they want insurers to pay for everything that's available. And since everything's available, we then would need knowledge. And so then where would the knowledge come from? And we're back to, well, we either publicly fund it and then insurers base decisions on that. And then they don't cover and do cover. And then insurers would vary. But then, oh, my God, I mean, we went through this, right, with the Patient Bill of Rights in the early 90s. I mean, when insurance companies start to crack down and say that something's not approved and we're going to constrain you, all hell breaks loose because, Americans like healthcare. I mean, it may, I mean, and so again, the Cato world that you describe would eventually have to run in, into insurance. And then uh, that I described what would happen there. And I don't know what would happen there. I, I want to go back. To, the human challenge trials is interesting because in the pandemic, you know, we, we learned that we had the vaccine in January of 2020. And then we spent. Well, sort of. I mean, here's what's. A, I mean, let me put in my editorial comment, which is: Do you know what Europe did made sense, and what we did it made absolutely no sense in terms of diversified portfolio of? I mean, if if I'm a risk management officer for the United States, would you want to place Operation Warp Speed on a never proven messenger RNA vaccine technology that had never ever worked? Whereas J&J and AstraZeneca were using vaccine technologies that were totally wonderful and had been shown to be useful in other contexts. So Europe, but that now looks like it's behind the eight ball, actually was very sensible. The U.S. was an extremely high risk, absolutely stupid bet, which happened to work out. All right. So be careful in saying that. I mean, I am... If, if the world had gone the way we had thought it should have gone, given our knowledge a year and a half ago, um, the, the New York Times would be saying how stupid the Trump administration, I mean, only the Republicans would make a stupid bet like this, right? Do you notice how no one is saying this? And yet I think from a financial portfolio 
way of thinking about things that claim that we knew we had something that worked in, in February 2020, I would say absolutely no way, Jose. No, not okay, true. Well, we just looked well, even, at Even then, when, when let's say you know a few months later when – Things are looking more promising, but this idea of human challenge trials, which, which, you know, at this time when people, there will be a lot of people probably willing to say, you know, I'll, I'll try it out. And it's interesting because, you know, <laughs> we pay, we pay people to take risks. You know, we, we pay people to strap them to rockets and blast them into space. And, and one of the, you know, one of the problems with NASA, it, one of the reasons NASA is, you know, not terribly good at what it does is because it cares too much about astronauts. That's one take, right? Like, it's like, you just said, there's someone out there who's like, man, we're going to blast you to Mars and it's a 50, 50 chance you're coming home, but you could have a hell of a ride on the way. Right. We do that. You know, I think we should do that more with space, but like why we should do that in times like this with pandemics, we should definitely be paying people. And I, th I don't think it would be that expensive or difficult to do. Yeah. Fair to me. <laughs> no I'm dispute not, there. <laughs> I have no views. One, I mean, I'm saying let's, let's try it. It's then to, just to clarify then when we're talking about the need to pay people to participate or in the scenario, we're just talking about the need to pay people not to take this, this medication. How many people are we talking about? Well, like if we need to find an effective medication and we need to pay some group not to take it, do we need 50% of the people who might benefit from it to not take it? Do we need 10%? Oh, you need, I mean, I thought you were asking a different question, which is how large should the N of the total trial be? Well, I and guess so then both. The answer that, and, then ha and then you always divide in half. I mean, there's just half are assigned to some treatment and half are assigned to nothing or standard of care. And then based on some science that we have, we then unblind the results at some time in the future and we see what the results are. Where the, is the end, the difference in, in means sufficiently large enough. So then we have to insert the non-scientific question is what, how confident do you want to be in this result and what level of side effects in terms of percent do you do you want to worry about and then once you tell me that answer i can tell you how many people we need to pay and a chart i gave you in the outline is if you want to worry about things in the one percent range you've got to have you know thousands and thousands of people in the trial and that's why, and no one, I mean, that's just a lot, a lot of money. I mean, I gave you some data, I think, which is I've always, uh, in these discussions, th there's, there's a lot of papers out there that say how much it costs to bring a new drug to market in the U.S., right, under the current regime. And it's in the billions of dollars. All right, so what percent of those costs are the trial costs versus, let's call it the science R&D costs? In other words, if we had no trial requirement and we just had laissez-faire, and we, then we still had R&D, how much would drug prices go down? Or how much of the current drug price is R&D versus trials? And the answer I found was in uh, basically in the last 10 to 15 years, 62% uh, of drug costs are trials and only 38 are the scientists doing the what's called pre preclinical r and d and so the trials are expensive and the so how rare an event do you want to worry about and in the viox case we found that to one percent of heart attacks sort of weren't visible in the n at the in the at, before the fda approval and then in the, in the much larger trials that occurred by accident, actually. It was Merck was greedy <laughs> and wanted to claim that this, that Vioxx was the best thing since sliced bread. So they did a trial versus naproxen. And then there was some theory, and it was reasonable, that it might actually uh, reduce colon cancer, that Vioxx would reduce a recurrence of polyps in people who'd had polyps in a colonoscopy. And oh, wow, do you I mean people hate colonoscopies and colon cancer is? An ugly death. So wouldn't it be wonderful if Viax could stop that? So they did two big trials after, after it was approved that Merck paid for called post-marketing trials. And they had 8,000 people or so, and they found 1% heart attack rate because the N was sufficiently large, whereas the trials before 
uh, approval were, were much, much smaller. So we're back to what, how, you know, and is 1% heart attack rate worth it? Well, not if, because everyone was taking Vioxx, 300 million people. I mean, my wife was taking Vioxx. Vioxx was wonderful. It reduced arthritis pain beautifully. Well, it causes heart attacks at a great, not horrible, but at a rate greater than standard of care or naproxen or, or and since a quarter of people who have heart attacks die, I was, yeah. So, it so, real. you know, it's, it's so much with our discussions with you, Peter, when, when they're always enlightening and, and if people are looking for the bottom line, <laughs> you know, this, you're the economist, do you want to, you know, on the other hand question here, but is there a bottom line in terms of, of, the way we we should think about the FDA as libertarians or just sort of, you know, do we we shouldn't just say it's a necessary thing the government does, everything that it does is correct, because as you pointed out, the politics of the FDA are pretty risk averse. Um, so we should be probably be aware of the fact that that they will pay costs for those heart attacks, but the unseen are all the people who died because they didn't get the drug. And that's a really hard thing to pinpoint. So, I mean, I mean, is that just something we have to live with or, I mean, what can we, you know, is the FDA. Well, what I, again, my, what I said earlier is I would like to shift the Cato discussion from good FDA, bad FDA to, uh, to one, we should be for the separation. Uh, we, we should not try to acquire knowledge through banning decisions, right? In other words, we, we ban products being on the market as a backdoor way to pay for the acquisition of knowledge. Because we make companies pay for the acquisition of knowledge, they try to game the system so that the trial's design will help them, not hurt them, right? So in the Vioxx case, Merck excluded people with heart attack risks from their original trials because there was some metabolic chemistry that their scientists were well aware of that the way this drug worked would in fact might have uh, cardiovascular risks. All right. So, th so then you want Cato designing the trial or somebody, you don't want Merck designing the trial, right? So the, the, the current system gets knowledge, but it doesn't get you know, totally unbiased, wonderful knowledge. It gets knowledge that companies want to uh, help them in their effort to sell stuff and make stuff approved. So I think Cato should be for inventive ways of trying to separate the acquisition of knowledge from the uh, decisions to use or not use things. And rather than say the world would be wonderful with the FDA, it's just that we should be both for knowledge acquisition because it's useful for consumers to, to, to make decisions. And we shouldn't interfere with decisions as a first order of course. Uh, totally agreed. The puzzle is be, because we tend to just be anti FDA in my view, we haven't be, gotten creative in our ways to, uh, get people to realize that we're not against not, we're not for just everyone taking stuff and dying all the time. No, that's not what we're for. We're for the acquisition of knowledge, but we don't want to interfere with people's decisions either. That's also a, a big priority for us. And the world hasn't been very kind to us in allowing us to kind of navigate those two goals at the same time, because most of the world has linked the acquisition of knowledge to constraining decisions and very few experiments have been conducted other than challenge trials to try to delink those two. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.